So welcome to the Pediatric Dermatology Research Alliance special series on emerging methods of action in the treatment of moderate to severe alopecia areata in children. This is part one, uh, a clinical overview. We'll have two other webinars and then podcasts following this webinar. A couple of housekeeping items for optimal viewing. If you're able to hop on a laptop or desktop, that'll give you the best screen tonight. Um, we are recording the webinar. It will be made available on the PEDRA website on demand, as well as PEDRA's mobile app. If you don't have the app, you can go to Apple or Google Play and search for PEDRA Research and download us. If you have specific questions tonight, please feel free to ask them throughout the presentations. We will answer them at the end of all of the talks. Uh, we please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. A quick overview of our schedule this evening. Dr. Craig Lowe is going to start us off with uh, an introduction to the program and Dr. Castello Socio will follow up uh, with another presentation and then we'll end the evening with our moderated Q&A. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you your program co-chairs and speakers this evening. Dr. Leslie Castello Socio is the Assistant Professor of Dermatology and Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania Perelman School of Medicine and Director of Research in the Section of Dermatology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Dr. Britt Craiglow is the Adjunct Associate Professor of Dermatology at Yale and sees patients in private practice in Fairfield, Connecticut. Thank you both for joining us this evening and for co-chairing this program. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Craiglow. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I am going to try to get where I want to go. So this, I'm really excited. This is the first time I've ever used a uh, virtual background. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really uh, up with the times here. Um, so just very quickly, I'm like, kudos to all of you for um, taking time out of your night to do this. Our, you know, we've thought a lot about these talks and this one, we wanted to be really more of kind of a practical discussion. You know, when you actually have that patient in your clinic with alopecia areata, what are the kind of things to talk about, how to address questions. And um, so these are just my disclosures. And if we have time after Leslie talks, I may go back to doing a little bit about uh, treatment, but we'll kind of see um, where we're at there. All right, so, so if you leave, Oh, you know, leave this with nothing else. Um, this is the slide I want you to remember. This is my son, his first haircut. And even he knew at like 12 months old, that hair is a very big deal. Okay. So I think, you know, we see a lot of skin disease and we see a lot of things in clinic that are hard and, um, may have more symptoms, uh, may, you know, in our mind, maybe disrupt sleep and have kind of other impacts that alopecia areata doesn't, but, I, you know, I see a lot of hair loss in my clinic and I, there's not much like it. Um, and so it's something that we need to, you know, kind of recognize and understand and be empathetic about when we see these patients. So, um, I know that a lot of you are peds derms. And so this is kind of like preaching, you know, telling you something you already know, but, um, you know, alopecia areata is uh, non-scarring alopecia. We see it a lot in kids. Um, typically, you know, we see a kid come in with one or two patches, um, but there are other, you know, there's a spectrum of disease. And I think, you know, a lot of people come in a kid who has like complete scalp hair loss, the parents will say, well, does he have alopecia totalis? Does he have alopecia areata? It's like confusing. And I, I really, um, I actually tend to kind of stay away from the terms alopecia totalis and universalis because we don't have great definitions for those. And it really is all a spectrum. Um, so I'll, you know, kind of more talk about the percent involvement of the scalp or complete scalp hair loss, complete scalp and body hair loss, things like that. And then diffuse AA is, you know, most of these diagnoses are very obvious when we see the patient, like it's not, you know, there's no question about what it is. Um, but diffuse AA every so often can be very subtle or a little bit challenging, um, and often looking at the nails can be helpful when you see that. So here are just a few of my patients with alopecia areata, just to kind of show the spectrum. Um, I just want to point your attention to these couple pictures of diffuse alopecia areata. So it can be very, very subtle. Um, but we do see it not infrequently in kids. And sometimes like actually the mother of this child, I remember when she came in, she's like, I don't know, you know, everybody's telling me I'm crazy, but I really think that 
you know, her hair is thinner than it used to be. And, you know, lo and behold, when I looked with my derm light, she did have like lots of exclamation point hairs on dermoscopy and that I would say, so I, I, I'm the first to admit that I'm not like amazing with the dermatoscope. Um, but I will tell you, like, just start looking at scalps, like just start looking them, you know, in your patients who you're doing a skin check and, and use your derm light and look at scalp hair. Um, and alopecia areata in active disease, you often will see these little exclamation point hairs and, and in diffuse disease, you got to look through where it looks a little bit more, um, sparse, but it's, um, you will find them. And in, in more longstanding disease, you're going to see more of these like yellow globules here. Um, but even in diffuse AA, I like to kind of look all throughout the scalp because there may be areas where it's sort of obviously thinner, but you can see a lot of this going on elsewhere. So get your derm light out. Um, don't be afraid of it because it actually can really, you know, it can be helpful kind of as a measure of disease activity. Um, so this is a common disease. I mean, I, that's one of the first things I tell patients and families is like, actually, this is very common. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that because they've never met somebody who has it or maybe they do know someone who has it, but that patient, um, you know, wears a wig or just has patches that can be concealed. And it was kind of cool when I was a fellow, um, we had a couple of teenage patients who both had alopecia areata, kind of more patchy disease that they were able to conceal. And one of them did their like sophomore biology project on AA and, and the other kid who also happened to be one of our patients within the class. And afterwards, like, well, I didn't know you had alopecia areata and she, I didn't know you had either. And so, um, but I think a lot of people with this diagnosis really do feel alone. And I think, you know, we see that with a lot of stuff we see in peds derm because, um, you know, a lot of things we do see are super rare, but even AA, which is common, I think a lot of people don't realize how prevalent it is. And a lot of these patients are going to present in childhood. Um, so for sure there are people who, you know, go their whole life and it's not till they're 40 years old that they develop patches, but a lot of these patients will start earlier on. And we know that, um, earlier onset does tend to suggest a more, you know, a poorer prognosis, um, over time. And, and in these patients, we do see higher rates of autoimmune disease, most commonly, um, autoimmune thyroid disease, atopic dermatitis is like, you know, 30%, up to 30% of kids will have that, um, not so much autoimmune, but kind of in that spectrum. And a lot of times there will be a family history of one of these things. So often in, in the history, I'll say, oh, you know, does anybody in the family have alopecia areata? Often it's a no. Um, anybody with rheumatoid arthritis, anybody with thyroid disease, vitiligo, things like that. And often you'll get something in there, but sometimes there's not. And a lot of times the families are like, nobody has it. You know, why do they have it? And that's something we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, and, and like I said, this is, this can be tough. Um, and I think, you know, these visits are, they are, they take a little bit longer. They require more time and attention. Like these patients really need to feel heard and understood. And so I, you know, when I see patients new for hair loss, I book them like at the end of my clinic so that I can make sure I have enough time to spend with them. And if I have to take my whole lunch, you know, I do that because you don't want to kind of be in a room with a new patient who has a lot of questions and has a lot of emotions going on and feel like you're, you know, you got to rush out the door. So, um, you know, not surprising, I don't think to those of us who see this all the time, but um, patients with alopecia areata have an impairment in health related quality of life. This was just a systematic review that we did a few years ago with the great um, medical student who's now a derm resident at um, Stanford and she's applying for Peds Derm Fellowship. So if any of you are fellowship directors, Lucy is amazing. Um, and so we just looked at all the data that there was and, um, you know, kind of averaging out these, the impact of AA was very similar to um, rates among patients with atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. And I think, you know, what's important about that is often, so AA, sometimes people do have symptoms. And I think I actually didn't, I didn't realize how common that was, but in active shedding, not infrequently patients will complain of itch or tingling or burning, but they're, the symptoms are very different from like atopic derm where kids are up all night scratching, right? They're very uncomfortable. And yet the impact is similar. So that kind of emotional burden um, is actually, you know, even more so in alopecia areata because all these quality of life things are talking about symptoms too. So kind of just goes to show you. Um, and I think like really importantly, again, in peds derm, we know this, but you know, when the patient has alopecia areata, so does the whole family. So I think it's really important, especially with kids, um, you know, 
to talk about this and to acknowledge the feelings of the parent. And oftentimes when the kid's really little, when they're one or two or three, like they may be totally unaware. And so a lot of it is talking with the parent. Um, and so both Leslie and I have looked at this um, quality of life among families. And um, interestingly, in our survey, we found that some of the family members may actually have, you know, worse impairment in quality of life compared to the patients. And then um, they also, this correlated with scores on, uh, worse scores on depression screeners. And then uh, Leslie looked at patients um, and parents. So um, those dyads, and again, the emotional domain scores were similar to those that parents report in other very chronic diseases like diabetes and asthma. And they found that the kind of the overall quality of life of parents decreases as the severity increases and the age of the child increases. And probably the emotional part is a little bit more closely related to the severity um, rather than age. And I think that makes sense, right? Because the more severe the AA is, probably the more affected, you know, the, the patient is going to be in terms of, you know, it impacting their everyday life. Um, so I think, you know, we do a lot of this talking like alopecia areata affects quality of life and it's also associated with depression and anxiety, but I think sometimes that can take away from the fact that it really and truly is a medical disease. And I think, you know, a lot of, you know, insurers and even physicians, like there's this whole kind of, oh, it's just hair and, and and it's thought about in a little bit of a different way, but alopecia areata is a medical disease, just like any of these other things that we see. We know the pathogenesis, which we're going to get into with some of like the big time scientists in the next webinar, which is going to be really cool. But we know that there are T cells that infiltrate the hair follicle. We know how they signal like this is, this is a medical disease and it deserves medical therapy. And we need to kind of treat it the same way that we do other conditions. So it's really not just hair. Um, so in the exam room, I think, you know, before you even kind of get to talking about treatment, if you're going to do treatment, it's really important to, to kind of understand the patient's and the family's experience of the disease. And so I think, you know, I, I, I find a lot that kid, like, especially teenagers, they will, they will kind of underestimate or downplay. Um, and so these are just some of the questions that, that I might ask, um, you know, kind of, how are you doing is sort of open-ended and a lot of times it'll be, I'm fine it's okay. You know, it's no big deal, but then you kind of delve deeper and asking, you know, is there anything that you used to do that you don't do now? Well, she really won't go swimming. Oh yeah. You know, he used to, um, he used to play soccer and he can't wear a hat. And so now he doesn't anymore. And so there are little kind of things like that, that you can tease out. Um, and then just kind of seeing how the patient reacts, you know, I had like a, I saw a patient this week who's had, complete scalp body hair loss for many years and is coping really very well. It's not sort of impacting her day to day, but when we started talking about it, she got very tearful. And so I think just spending a little bit of time is important to see, you know, where, where the patient is, is at in their experience of it. And I think beyond that, it's really important to let people know that it's normal for it to be hard. Um, and I think like a lot of, there's a really interesting psychology with alopecia areata, I think, because there's this sense that, well, you're not sick, so it could be so much worse. Right. And I think parents especially have this kind of like, you know, people think their child has cancer, but their child doesn't have cancer. And, oh my gosh, that would be so much worse. So it's, how can I be feeling bad about this? And then there's almost this sort of guilt that goes along with it. Like they feel bad that they feel bad, but I think it's important to, rem to tell them like, look, the way you feel is normal. And like, it's okay. Like, could it be worse? Yes, of course. Like it could always be worse. And you understand that, but that doesn't have to minimize your experience of it. Like hair is a, you know, a biologically conserved thing. It's very important. It's part of our identity. If you don't have it, you cannot interact with the world in the same way that you did before when you had it. And that's just the way it is. So I think really kind of acknowledging it and normalizing it is very important. And sometimes like in this conversation, I, I see sort of the parents like kind of, Oh, you know, like somebody hears me because you know, their friends and family are going to be saying, it's okay. It's just here. He's handsome or she's beautiful. And, and maybe those things on, in a sense are true, but it doesn't feel good when you're, when you're feeling really upset about something. Um, so 
in terms of like a new diagnosis or going to a new school, like I think, you know, the more, especially, you know, younger kids, the more you can kind of be proactive, the better. So, um, you know, starting preschool, talking with the teachers, talking with the head of the school, I've had parents even write a letter home um, to the other parents, have a little circle time with the class, you know, Johnny has something called alopecia areata. It makes his hair, you know, not grow in all the way, et cetera. You know, kind of decide what what um, you're going to say, but just kind of put it out there, especially in younger children, because mostly younger kids are just curious. Like they want to, you know, a lot of them may not even notice it, you know, kind of in preschool. But as long as they know you're okay and what it is, usually they kind of move on. Um, older kids, it can be tougher. I think um, a lot of a lot of patients, this is something they really hide and keep to themselves, especially if they're able to like wear a wig or style their hair so that it's covered. But I think that when you, you, that's a big burden to carry. Um, and so at least for teenagers, if they don't want the world to know, that's totally understandable and okay. But to have maybe a couple of friends who know about it, who they can talk to, who they can be comfortable with, um, is, you know, is really helpful. And then being prepared for questions. I think, you know, it is going to happen. Like it's just human nature to be curious and people are going to ask. And so I often will ask kids, especially kids kind of elementary school. So, you know, what, if someone asks you, do it, does anybody ever ask you about it? And usually almost always they say, yeah. And I say, well, so what do you say when they ask? And a lot of times they just go blank because they don't, really have something to say. And I think that situation in real life is very stressful and upsetting. And it's the kind of thing that can like, you're having a good day. Then someone asks you about it. It reminds you about it. And then you're, you know, everything is crummy after that. So having an answer to the question, I think is really important. Um, and so I think probably a lot of, you know, about this changing faces, this is like a foundation that sort of is all about visible differences. And I think very useful because a lot of what we do in Durham is, you know, patients have a visible difference. So I really like the way they kind of approach, you know, how you, how you deal with questions. So, um, the way I explain it to families is like, you explain, you reassure, and then you redirect. So for an example, you know, Oh, I have alopecia. So explain, um, you know, it's just, my body doesn't grow hair reassure. I'm not sick. They want to make sure you're okay, especially people with complete hair loss. And then you want to change the subject quickly. So, oh, did you get new sneakers or what'd you do this weekend? Or let's go play X, Y, or Z. And I literally tell them to like make a script and practice it, like practice at the breakfast table. So you're ready, you know, ultimately, hopefully we, we treat them and we get to a point where they don't have to answer the questions, but it's really helpful. I think to be prepared, like when they do, when they do arise and this is like, their website is great. They have a lot of nice resources. So if you, if you haven't seen it, I would encourage you um, to check it out. So just a few other things. Um, NAF is the national health Pichariata foundation. I always, uh, tell people though, you know, especially for a mild disease, like if you go to the homepage, usually they have people who have complete scalp hair loss. And if you're, if you've just been diagnosed and your child only has a couple of patches and you see that, that can be very overwhelming and kind of scary. So, um, you know, it may or may not be for you. And then these other things that we, um, hair club will give hair pieces to kids under 18, um, for free. And then, um, you know, locks of love and things like this, because, you know, wigs are, they're very expensive. Um, and these things, they are a lot of, you know, a big out of pocket burden on families. So some of these things can be helpful. Um, so this is just like a quick segue into Leslie's portion where she's going to be <laughs> a lot less, you know, a lot more scientific and less kind of touchy feely than I am. So, um, so hang on. Um, but you know, everybody wants to know why did this happen, right? It's like, why did she have this? And everybody kind of comes in with their story. Well, two months ago, she got a vaccine or he was sick or we took a trip or they were stressed out, you know, and, and oftentimes people kind of want to latch on to that as the reason, which I think is human nature. Like we all want to have a why, right? Like that's just the way we are. Um, but what I try to tell people is that look like, most of us can look back on our life a few months and identify something that was a little bit different, right? Does that mean that that's the reason that the alopecia areata was triggered or happened? Probably not, right? And we really don't understand the triggers well. They're probably multifactorial. And 
I get that it's frustrating not to know because you want to have something that you want to know the why so that you can end up controlling that in the future so that it doesn't happen again if you know you're a waxing and waning person. But usually what I try to do is like I tell them like you're gonna you're gonna spend a lot of mental energy on this and you're not gonna get anywhere. Like you're gonna be second guessing every little thing. And it's it it isn't any of those things, probably, at least not that we know of. It's not one of them anyway. There's nothing that you probably did or didn't do that could have changed this path. And so instead of kind of focusing on that, let's move towards like, okay, how, like, how are we going to deal with this? What are we going to do about it? Um, rather than kind of focusing on why, and again, acknowledging that that's normal to do and it's okay. And like, if it were my kid, I would probably do the same, but you know, it can be kind of exhausting and not ultimately sort of helpful and helping people kind of move forward. So with that, I am going to stop sharing and Leslie is going to tell you about some cool, um, some work that she's done to kind of help address sort of what do we do when we see the patient? Um, how do we address some of those exam room questions? It's a great introduction, um, Britt. I'm super thrilled to be here. Um, I think this is a really important um, series uh, and I'm hope you will kind of continue with the series because I think the um, scientific talks and the podcasts are going to be amazing. Um, so when we're in the office, we, you know, we get tons of questions. Um, I actually, I love when parents come with a lot of questions, believe it or not, because it says that they're prepared and they're invested. And I think we just need like a, a practical kind of approach to answering these questions without spending, you know, two hours in the visit, but letting the families feel like they're um, getting your time and um, your expertise. So I think, you know, when I think of the themes that come up, it's usually, you know, what workup should we do? What blood work should we do? Um, what diet, micronutrients, macronutrients, and, you know, families know more about this than I do. Um, uh, why, you know, they ask great questions, like, why does this happen seasonally? It seems to happen when I have my, my kid has their allergies. And so I think, you know, the questions are also important because they drive research questions and they drive, you know, the gaps in knowledge that, you know, we have as um, clinicians. So when I think of workup, you know, I really do minimal or none. And I know that's going to like, you know, surprise some people and some people feel that feel like they want to do more because of that increased risk for um, secondary autoimmune disease. But at least initially, you know, I, I try to emphasize to families that we're not really looking for the root cause, right? We know that the cause is genetic predisposition. We don't understand all the environmental triggers, but blood testing isn't going to give us the cause. You know, many patients come in, you know, with lots of tests and, you know, I usually reassure them and say, great, we expected all these tests to be normal or negative. Um, now let's move forward and, you know, talk about how we're going to, you know, tackle the, um, the disease. I think, um, you know, when I say that, most people say, well, what about thyroid testing? Um, and it's true. If you look at the literature, there's some sparse literature about, um, one, the epidemiology of patients with alopecia areata and their increased risk for um, autoimmune thyroid disease. You know, lifetime risk probably increases to about 15%. You know, an average, you know, woman, a lifetime risk is about 5%. So it's certainly higher than the general population, but often doesn't occur in childhood or children who have autoimmune thyroid disease actually present with that first, and then their alopecia. And I know you'll think of ex examples of kids who have it happen secondarily, and I can too. Um, but I don't know that that means that we should be testing every child who, on their first presentation. Um, what we see in the literature is that autoantibodies are detected in higher rates in patients with AA. And the more severe your disease, the higher rate of the autoantibodies. Um, when we looked at um, pediatric patients and um, thyroid testing um, in 2017, we found that the highest risk was among patients who had um, concomitant trisomy 21 
or had a first degree relative with a true autoimmune thyroid disease. Because we know that in the office, when we ask about thyroid disease, sometimes we're not sure that the family member actually has autoimmune thyroid disease. So, you know, who would we test? What test should we do? So when I worked with endocrine, you know, their thought was really just do a TSH and a free T4 and only if those are positive um, thyroid autoantibodies. But if you're doing a test, you know, a blood test in a young child, probably just doing them all at once would be the thing to do. But we're only testing a few patients, right? So we're only testing those with first degree relatives with autoimmune thyroid disease or individuals with genetics disorders that make them more likely to get thyroid disease like trisomy 21. And of course, we have the benefit of looking at growth curves, um, talking about symptoms, and we can test those with true signs or symptoms. Um, and usually I will say, you know, constipation that's new and lasts more than three weeks. Um, you know, fatigue that prevents children from their normal activities, because some of these, as you know, can be, you know, hard to um, kind of parcel out um, for a young child. The next big question I always get from families is, you know, should we, um, one, either remove gluten or get um, celiac testing? So, you know, this is a question I thought about a lot because families asked it to me a lot um, very early when I started. And, you know, the truth is the prevalence of celiac disease in, um, in North America, Western Europe, is about the same as the prevalence of AA and celiac disease together. So if we look at you know, the data, um, it ranges for anywhere from 0.15% to 2.7%. And the best data that we have for alopecia areata is about 1.2% prevalence. You know, we do know that there are connections, right? So the beautiful work that was done by Angela Cristiano and, um, and her postdocs and um, colleagues showed that alopecia areata and celiac had um, shared variants when they did genome-wide association studies. But despite that, and the closeness of the connection between these as two autoimmune diseases, the results of small series really show at most a slight greater risk than the general population. So, you know, again, it comes down to who should we test if asymptomatic? I don't feel the need to test anyone who asks me to test them unless they have a first degree relative that has celiac disease. And if you look at the North American um, gastroenterology guidelines, those patients who have a first degree relative have about a 10% chance of being affected. And again, this is, you know, lifetime, not in any, you know, not in any one period of time. Um, and then patients who have Down syndrome, Williams, Turner, um, already have autoimmune thyroid disorders, um, type one diabetes. And that's a comparison. This um, table is a comparison to the general population where um, there's about, a, they, they say there's about a 1% um, risk versus you know, someone with thyroid disease who has maybe a 3% risk. Again, that risk is pretty low. Um, I emphasize to families that it's not just a blood test, right? So if you do get a positive and you must, you know, you have to do IgA, um, TTG, as well as total IgA, um, then the next step is a small bi bowel biopsy. And so many patients, once they hear that, actually will not actually want to do the testing because they know that um, it involves more than um, just a blood test. And then the big question comes down to, you know, does eliminating gluten help patients with alopecia areata? And the best data that we have says only if you have celiac disease. So there's a single study which looked at um, uh, about 100 patients with celiac disease and alopecia areata and did show that when patients with both um, concomitant diseases had um, a gluten-free diet, they had um, increased um, growth. However, they also looked at a population of patients with alopecia, living with alopecia who didn't have celiac disease and changed their diet and didn't see any improvement um, beyond what they would expect for hair uh, regrowth. Growth. There's no clear therapeutic trial timeline either if you decide or a family decides to go gluten free. So, is it three months? Is it six months? Um, you know, the best data that we have is from the autism literature, and it suggests that it has to be um, three to six months um, as a therapeutic trial. 
And then for many children, foods with glutens can be a great source of fiber and vitamins. I know we don't need fortified foods to get these, but many children's diets primarily um, will get fiber and vitamins from gluten um, uh, packaged foods. So take home for, you know, celiac is, you know, gluten-free diets are beneficial if you have celiac disease, which kind of makes sense. Um, most patients should not be tested because the prevalence um, in the alopecia areata population is really not different than the general um, US population. We should test high risk patients. So as I talked about, first degree relative, um, genetic disorders that put you at higher risk or if patients already have um, a second autoimmune um, disorder. And then again, those with signs or symptoms, um, anemias, changes in their growth curve or not growing on their growth curve, um, abdominal pain. And then the best test is serum plus that um, confirmatory biopsy. Um, when we think about the next question that always comes up, it's always about diet and vitamins. So, you know, what diet should my um, child be on? What foods should I eliminate? What vitamins should I give my child? And the primary vitamins that I'll talk about are vitamin D and biotin. So um, multiple studies do show that patients living with alopecia areata do have decreased vitamin D um, levels. One study showed there are higher rates in chronic relapsing disease. This is a, um, a summary of um, uh, all the uh, case reports, cross-sectional studies, um, and um, systematic reviews of patients um, with alopecia areata and their levels of vitamin D. And you can see that in the majority of them, patients living with alopecia areata had lower vitamin D levels. The majority of these did not look at with a control population, some did. You know, rates of vitamin D deficiency are generally high in the pediatric population. If I wanna pick a test where I know I'm gonna get an abnormal value, um, I can pick vitamin D every time. So, you know, 9% of the pediatric population um, is vitamin D deficient. And in one um, large national health and nutrition um, survey, showed that 61% of children um, were, had insufficient levels of vitamin D. We looked um, at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia population to see you know, what um, the level of vitamin D um, deficiency was in patients with alopecia areata and had criteria about no supplementation and they had to have at least one you know, um, uh, lab test. And we found not surprisingly that um, non-summer months, higher Fitzpatrick type or more pigment in your skin was associated with um, low vitamin D levels. But the majority of kids that we looked at had suboptimal vitamin D levels. 33% um, had insufficient levels and 21% were deficient. So then you ask like, do I check vitamin D? So sometimes I'll check it, um, especially if I'm checking, you know, other levels or I'm checking thyroid testing, but generally no, because you know, the data, there's no data that supports that supplementing vitamin D actually impacts the um, regrowth of hair or the severity of your alopecia. Often I'll just recommend that, you know, kids who are, um, you know, picky eaters or, you know, you know eaters that are, you know, sometimes eat one thing and sometimes don't eat things, um, take a multivitamin that has vitamin D in it. You could give a separate vitamin D and that can ensure adequate levels. So biotin supplements, you know, are always a hot topic with hair disorders. Um, and many patients come in already taking them because they've, you know, read um, information on the internet or they've gotten, um, you know, advice from family members. Um, and so they come in on vitamins. Um, I often will remind families of um, what are the vitamin um, B7 biotin rich foods. So those are, you know, eggs, almonds, um, sweet potatoes, tomatoes, you know, carrots, a lot of things that kids sometimes like to eat. 
Um, biotin deficiency, you know, primary is pretty rare. Secondary deficiency does occur. And, you know, it occurs in our patient population, right? So um, patients who have malabsorption for a number of reasons, you know, when we're seeing complex patients, patients who are on prolonged use of medications, right? Isotretinoin, valproic acid, long-term antibiotic use. So deficiency can happen. But you know the the data for you know biotin and hair really comes from the study from 1952, and this was a study in mice that um, they presented the mice with a biotin deficient diet for a number of um, weeks, and then they reintroduced biotin, and the mice regrew hair and they had pigmented hair again. In the literature, there's only 18 reported cases of using biotin for hair disorders, and the majority of them are not alopecia areata. Um, actually, none of them are purely alopecia areata. Most are for enzyme deficiency. A few were for uncombable hair. Um, some of them were deficiencies related to um, specific formulas. And then there's one study of about 500 patients who ranged in age from nine to 92, were, who were um, all comers with hair loss. And they did find that um, in that group, about 33% of patients had low vitamin D, sorry, low biotin. Um, and those usually though had, were patients who were on chronic um, medications, um, who had uh, intestinal um, difficulties um, or uh, who were on um, anticonvulsants. Um, so, you know, I don't know that the, the pure data on using biotin outside of the mice and this um, small group of case reports is, um, is very strong. So, you know, do I give it? You know, I think in general, um, it's not a harmful, um, you know, vitamin to give. Most multivitamins have it in it. Um, you know, but I remind families that the daily requirement for kids is really small. So if you take a child who's anywhere between four and 13 years of age, their daily requirement is somewhere between 12 and 20 micrograms, right? And when we look at, um, you know, the supplements, they're 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. So, you know, if someone wants to give it, I might say, well, once a week, you can give it to them and they'll supplement pretty quickly. And then I recommend, you know, foods rich in biotin. So, you know, brown rice, nuts, whole grains, egg yolks um, as an option. There is though, as I say this, you know, emerging data about, um, you know, bacteria in our guts and the ability to absorb biotin and how again in mice, this may play a role in, um, in hair loss. And so there are two um, really interesting um, studies, which I don't have time to go into, that look at um, mice who um, had overgrowth of certain types of bacteria in their gut due to antibiotics, um, and then had lost their ability to actually absorb biotin. But you know, this study also tells me that supplementing wouldn't help this population of, um, of mice because if they have that um, incorrect overgrowth of bacteria, no matter how much biotin we're giving them, they're still not absorbing it correctly. So, I mean, I think take home, probably there's no benefit from biotin unless you're deficient. If you're again, concerned about these uneven eaters, um, as I call them, <laughs> mostly toddlers and you know what we used to say is picky eaters, um, have them do a multivitamin. Um, gut bacteria might influence this. And you know, in five years, I might be saying something very different. Um, we do have to remember that biotin's other target is streptavidin or avidin, and these are used in a lot of competitive assays, particularly for thyroid testing, and then also for testing of um, troponins. And the FDA put out a warning in 2017 um, to remind patients that if they're getting this type of testing, that they shouldn't be on high um, supplements of biotin because the testing could be um, inaccurate or false. So, um, so that leads me to, you know, the microbiome. And so I've been getting more and more questions at the, about the microbiome as fecal transplants become more, um, you know, put in the lay press and, um, and patients have become really interested in, you know, in diet as a means to um, control um, autoimmune disease.
So I think most families are asking about, you know, personal dietary choices, what foods to remove, what pre and probiotics they should use. But we know that, you know, the microbiome is influenced by a lot of things, right? It's like your mode of delivery, your diet, your, whether you have siblings and pets, um, your age, um, you know, whether you needed antibiotics, where you live in the world, um, you know, what your general environment is like, city, country, um, et cetera. And so it's not really a very easy question to, uh, to answer. But we do know that as you know, newborns go to toddlerhood, there's a lot of change in the um, types of bacteria that are present in their guts. Until around age three or four, their gut microbiome becomes more like the adult. And this is something that's really interesting to me because this is the peak ages for like the first time that we see a lot of these autoimmune diseases. You know, For me, when I think of alopecia areata, I think of the first peak around four to six years old. This is just at the time where that microbiome makes a shift. And so when we're thinking about environmental factors, you know, probably this plays some role. Um, we know that the gut influences immunity, you know, and this has been, um, you know, looked at extensively with, you know, germ-free mice and then colonizing them with specific microbes so that we can influence um, how the immune system works. And we see like really broad effects on the immune system. Um, we know, you know, from um, the study I showed you that bacteria are critical for uptake of nutrients and vitamins and could play a role in kind of environmental things also in terms of, you know, can we sufficiently um, take up the nutrients that we're taking in. We know from mouse studies that if you manipulate the microbiome, you can have um, you know, less severity of your disease. And some of the biggest studies have been done in uh, mouse models of IBD and rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see that introducing certain bacteria will actually lead to disease. And then you know, having a germ-free environment, you may have no disease or you introduce specific bacteria and you have less severity. Um, that's true in, a, in humans too. So um, this is a, um, a group of pie charts which shows um, the types of um, bacteria that you see in um, adults without um, autoimmune disease and children without autoimmune disease. And then in populations with uh, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis or type one diabetes. And you see there is a shift in the type of bacteria that populate um, the gut. Um, and this is particularly true for multiple sclerosis where there's been a lot of work with diet um, uh, influencing severity and flares. For alopecia, you know, it, it's the interest really was peaked in 2017 um, from this study um, from Northwestern and University of Chicago and um, Brown of a patient who, um, uh, two patients who had inflammatory um, bowel disease and um, both developed um, C. diff infections and then they received fecal microbiome transplants. And lo and behold, their alopecia areata improved after um, FMT. And so, you know, this was super exciting. I mean, um, and so many patients, you know, thought, gosh, this is, you know, going to be the answer to um, alopecia areata. And then in 2019, there is a study out of China looking at a um, 80 plus year old woman who also developed C. diff and then had an FMT and had had longstanding alopecia areata and regrew her hair in her 80s, um, uh, pigmented hair in her 80s, amazingly. Um, and so, you know, so this is what spurred kind of the interest in alopecia areata. Um, is there higher level of evidence, you know, in, um, for the differences uh, in AA? So there's a little bit of data in adults um, from the 2019 and just at the SID, um, uh, a postdoc in Angela Cristiano's lab um, presented some work, primarily mouse work, looking at um, differences in the gut. Um, you know, so there, the differences that have been reported are small in terms of relative abundance of certain bacteria and certain um, populations, which are either too overgrown or underpopulated um, in patients living with alopecia.
we looked at, you know, sibling pairs um, who presumably have similar diets, who were within five years of age of each other, and did find small changes in um, certain abundance of bacteria, but overall the alpha and beta diversity in the um, microbiome, fecal microbiome samples was pretty um, uh, similar. So I think, you know, when I talk to patients about this, I talk about, you know, we're at the early stages of this. You know, right now we need to kind of uh, really figure out how those bacteria influence the um, immune system. Um, we may be able to start analyzing kids right at that critical change um, from, you know, kind of more diverse uh, gut microbiome to more adult-like microbiome. There is a clinical trial that's going on for adults with alopecia areata with um, fecal um, transplants, um, that has uh, just started recruiting. So we may learn more about um, changes in both the scalp uh, microbiome and the gut microbiome from that clinical trial. So I think, you know, today when patients ask this, I say, you know, it's not really which diet. It's like, we need to learn more. And, and I don't know which probiotic, I don't know which pro, um, prebiotic. And some of those actually may be harmful. Um, so diets rich in whole foods, um, you know, gluten-free if you have celiac disease. Um, and take-homes, you know, obviously the microbiome is important for immunity and autoimmune disease. Um, we still need to understand it. And then I'll end with like question about seasonality. So this is a question that comes up all the time. You know, patients who say, hey, you know, I know every year around this time I have a flare or it seems to correspond with when I have my really bad atopic dermatitis flares or my um, allergic rhinitis flares, you know, is there something to that? And so we looked at, you know, um, some of our patients and did see that there were certain flare periods by month. And it did seem like it was that kind of transition period where we see a lot of patients um, develop seasonal rhinitis. So March and, you know, October, November. And if you start like asking your patients, you'll see that they say, you know, I usually am, you know, many patients, not all, you know, are much better in the summer months. Um, and then, you know, kind of September, October start and I'm doing great. And then bam, I have a flare. And then it seems like, you know, for many patients, March, April is also a big flare time. And so is that related to their atopy? Because we know that 30, 40% of patients with AA also are atopic. Um, and the big question that parents ask is then, can we alter it by altering, you know, their rhinitis or the atopic derm flares? And then they ask about Allegra. And so I brought this up because parents ask all the time. And so there are two studies which look at um, fexofenadine. Um, there was one in 2009 where patients were treated with um, contact sensitizers and a small portion of those patients um, were also treated with oral Allegra. And in patients with AA and a topic background who got Allegra, they did better than patients who didn't get it. Um, and then in 2020, there was a small study of uh, you know, 150 patients and they were given adjuvant antihistamine with their standard alopecia areata treatment, um, which were, was um, topical uh, steroids. And um, in those patients, there appeared to be better growth when they um, were given um, fexofenadine. Um, so is it fexofenadine itself or is it just the antihistamine? You know, if patients have seasonal allergies and say they need an antihistamine and they want to take one, sometimes I'll say, great, you can take Allegra, you know, for that. But the data is pretty sparse um, in that regard. You know, I'm excited though about, you know, new therapies um, that, uh, you know, move away from um, just the um, JAK inhibitors. Although from your, from my graph, um, from my diagram, you can see that I don't really move away from the JAK inhibitors, but um, you know, there's a trial that was completed, but it's not been fully reported for IA and adults using Dupixent. Um, and we know that many patients from those GWAS studies have an IL-13 signature, um, especially those that have alopecia areata and um, an atopic dermatitis. And so would Dupixent, you know, work for these patients and kind of control those um, flares and maybe the seasonality of it? 
Um, and so, you know, we looked at about 18 patients um, and put them on um, Dupixent for both atopic dermatitis and alopecia areata. And we found that patients that did have um, atopy, um, so we had some patients who didn't have atopy, did really well when they were put on Dupixent. This was a longtime patient of mine who had this ophiasis pattern, um, was getting injections every six weeks, was pretty miserable, you know, um, you know, 13 year old, and we put her on Dupixent. And within a year, and now it's been more than um, two years, um, she hasn't needed any injections. Um, and we have patients who have, you know, 100% um, scalp hair loss who have been put on it and who have, um, you know, regrowth. Um, plus their, LP, their atopic dermatitis is a lot better. So I think there is, you know, um, room to start looking at um, subpopulations of patients with alopecia areata who also have um, significant ATP. So, you know, for, you know, take homes, I think, you know, seasonality exists for many. It may be related to atop ATP and atopic dermatitis or rhinitis. Um, it might be back to that vitamin D, per, you know, part of it and seeing a lot of patients who have low levels. And I do think there are possible adjuvant therapies for those with um, atopic symptoms. Thank you both so much. Those talks were wonderful. It is really, really important to recognize that this disease is so layered. It is a medical disease that comes with many psychosocial components and um, the, your discussions highlighted both of it so well. Um, so we have quite a few questions. Everybody, um, we will be going over time. If you have to leave for any reason and can't stay with us, the questions and answers will be recorded so that you can catch up on those in the on-demand version of the webinar. Uh, so let's jump right in. From Dr. Harfman to Britt, um, your emphasis on psychosocial impact was really great. Um, do you have a good way to assess psychological impact on young age, for example, preschool children, when the child is often not verbal while in the office and behaviors can be impacted or attributed to multiple factors? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I think, you know, for me, kind of the hardest age to treat or for me to see is like age kind of three to four, um, because when they're younger than that, they're usually not so much aware. And a lot of it is talking with the patients and my rules for the patients are, I mean, for the parent, talking to the parents, excuse me. And for the parents, I always tell them, look, like I have two rules. Number one is we have to treat the patient and not ourselves. And number two, like the treatment can never be worse than the disease. So for kids kind of under two, like that's really paramount. It doesn't mean we don't treat them, but you know, being very aggressive in that age group for a child who may not be aware is probably not something that's really worth doing. Once they hit three, four, it becomes harder because they are starting to develop a sense of self. And we know that self-esteem is being developed. So I think it really is, is very variable. I find that there's a distinct difference in children who start with alopecia areata very early, like before two, and then continue on because that like kids who don't know themselves with hair versus the child who has hair. And then all of a sudden at three or four years old loses it. Um, and that's a very different experience in general. I think usually for the patient, because it's, you know, part of their identity already when they're a little bit older, whereas if they have no memory of it, they tend to cope a little bit better. Um, I think like in that age group, you know, there often are sort of behavioral components that sometimes we don't even realize were, were related until the child gets their hair back. Like the parents are like, oh, wow, you know, I have like a different kid now that the mm -hmm. child was kind of angry or more, you know, physical or violent or not wanting to do things. Um, you know, sometimes we'll see, just little things like moms will say she won't look at herself in the mirror or, you know, she doesn't want to be on FaceTime with somebody or, you know, even the kids in the room, when you talk to them, and it's hard because you don't necessarily know the kid and a lot of kids are shy. Right. But um, sometimes the parents will say like, this is very different. Right. Um, and there are kids who, you know, by age three or four, they'll, they'll ask and they'll say, you know, I want my hair. Why don't I have it? And then other kids will be starting to point it out. Um, and I had just a mom the other day with a four-year-old and say, she notices that kids on the playground aren't playing with him. And she doesn't know if 
you know, whether it's related to his, you know, alopecia areata or not, but, but it may be right. And kids can identify these visible differences early. So I think, you know, for me and kind of having my own kids and seeing them at that age, I, I actually do treat earlier than I used to when it's clear, you know, that something's happening, but I do think sometimes the clues are subtle and, and you kind of have to, um, you know, ask questions and probe, but again, sometimes you don't actually know they were there until, you know, the child's better. Thank you. I hear parents say that the child has had a fever within days of the onset of AA. I emphasize that kids often get fevers and not generally associated, but curious on what your thoughts are. Either one of you want to comment? I mean, I, I often will talk about how, you know, when your immune system gets revved up, and it has this other program on it that it can do that program. And, and so, um, so I do think that there is something to parents noticing patterns with fevers or I, I hate to say vaccinations, but because um, I still tell them to get it, but I, I do think there is something to that. Um, and I, I just will couch it to them that like we, we can't, we're not gonna change them getting fevers, right? So there are things that we can control and things we can't. And you know, vaccines are really important because they can prevent a more severe disease. And if you have a more severe disease, your immune system would be even more out of whack. Um, but uh, but I but I agree. I mean, I hear all the time that you know related to illnesses. Yeah, I agree. I think I usually say the same thing. Look, is it possible that something else lighting up your immune system when you have this genetic predisposition can be a trigger or part of a trigger? Mm-hmm. Yes, but you know, as Leslie said, there's, I, I often feel like if it wasn't that thing, especially in kids with severe disease, it would be something else. Right. And so it's not, um, but again, it, we want to, you know, we want to hang, hang on to that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Another question from Dr. Colleen Cotton. Um, Hi, Leslie, in your 2017 paper, you reported a personal history of atopy as a risk factor for thyroid disease. What is your threshold for checking thyroid function in children with atopic dermatitis? This question came up twice. Yeah, thank, thanks, Colleen. I was trying to gloss over that um, piece of our, uh, our data <laughs> because it's tricky, right? Because so many kids have um, atopic dermatitis. Um, again, I think, you know, I do focus on um, a good review systems, really looking at growth curves um, to, to make a, a decision about whether we should do um, thyroid testing. So I don't check thyroid function in every child with AA and atopic dermatitis. Um, this question is from Maria. Do you have experience in obtaining dupixent for a patient with AA, but without atopic dermatitis? Either one of you can comment. Um, threshold for doing it? Uh, any experience in obtaining dupixent, yeah. Maybe more like insurance coverage, it sounds like. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I often can get it um, because a lot of the kids have um, moderate to severe atopic dermatitis in addition. And so usually if I'm asking for Dupixin, I'm asking for the atopic dermatitis. And I, I make that clear to the families that, you know, the reason that we're using the medicine is for your eczema or atopic derm. Mm. But if it has a side benefit of helping your alopecia, we'll take that. Um, you know, I think... Uh, insurance is not going to approve it for alopecia areata. Got it. Um, All right, for Leslie, what is your screening frequency in a given patient? I find that most patients and families are interested in lab work on the first visit for the reasons you mentioned, but then usually never bring it up again once the initial results are normal. For those who have normal labs initially, since these associated conditions could appear at any time in the appropriate patient, do you recommend rescreening yearly or only if signs symptoms arise? 
Yeah. So I, again, I'm a minimalist with like lab testing. So I tend to do only if signs or symptoms arise. A lot of families do ask me though, once kids are past the age of 10, they, um, you know, they'll start to get cholesterol checks every year with their pediatrician. And if they're getting yearly, you know, testing, they can always, you know, throw on a TSH, you know, at that point, um, if they, if the family really wants it, but I don't, um, I won't do that routinely. Right. Any additional comments? I agree. I mean, I, I, everything that Echo said that uh, Leslie said, I would echo. I, I almost never check labs for alopecia areata unless I need to check them for uh, a medication that I'm using. Um, so, and, and a lot of parents want to have the labs, but fortunately, a lot of them already come to us with the labs, <laughs> so we don't have to. But I, I think, um, you know, it's usually really not necessary unless something in the review of systems is suggestive. Um, Leslie, do you think fecal transplant studies are coming for kids? Um, you know, fecal transplant um, takes, is, can be challenging for younger children. Um, you know, you have to be in a certain position for like 10 hours. If you look at the guidelines for the recent um, clinical trial that's going on. So my guess is that if the results are amazing for adults, then there will be for children, but I think it's gonna be hard to get kids to cooperate with, um, with the preparation and then the positioning needed. Um, well, amazingly, we have made it through all the questions. Um, we're just a couple minutes past the hour. Uh, Britt, did you wanna say something about the upcoming webinars before we sign off? Yeah, sure. Um, so the next webinar, we are really excited to have um, Ali Jabari, who's done a lot of really like pioneering work with the mouse model of alopecia areata, identifying, um, you know, in Angela Cristiano's lab, the T cells that are, you know, promoting this vicious cycle through the jack stat pathway. And then um, Dr. John O'Shea from the NIH, who is like the father of Jack science and is going to, so we're going to kind of dive into pathogenesis of AA, um, looking at the mouse model and kind of real basic stuff with Dr. Jabari. And then Dr. O'Shea will give us more of kind of a broad overview of Jacks, which are, you know, Jack inhibitors in dermatology are, they're kind of the wave of the future for a lot of diseases. Um, so I think it will be useful not only for alopecia areata to learn about these um, and their mechanism, but also um, for other diseases as they're going to be approved for atopic dermatitis and they're being studied in other conditions. So hopefully you guys will join us. And again, thank you so much to everybody um, for coming. Right. Thank you. Thank you both. And uh, yes, please stay tuned for more information about the upcoming webinars, as um, Britt had just mentioned. Um, the science webinar is going to be fantastic with Dr. O'Shea and Dr. Jabari. So thank you all this evening. Thank you so much to Britt and Leslie. We so appreciate your time and this program, and we can't wait for the next installment.